Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, to everyone. Welcome to a webinar organized by the Hashim Sani Center for Palestine Studies, uh, which is on the topic of the Judaization of East Al Quds, which is going to be presented by Ms. Aina Tai Pratan. Uh, so, as uh, we uh, inform everyone in this seminar uh miss aina will be uh, discussing about israel's utilization of its al-quds from 1967 to 217 to, to 2017 sorry through its uh, various dimensions its legal political cultural economic and religious aspects and as we know um uh, Israel um, invaded uh, West Bank in 1967 and uh, being a settler colonized colonizing project is trying to get rid of uh, Palestinian indigenous Palestinian population and and the process includes uh, utilization of uh, the whole um, land of Palestine and um, Ms. Aina says uh, she we're talking about how the Judaization policy will be based on territorial expansions and expansionism and native minimization, meaning they want to make sure that the number of Palestinian indigenous population will be minimized as much as possible, and many have been expelled from their from their own land. But um, apparently, the the Judaization policy is being constrained by differences between Israeli political parties and as well as the international repercussions. So uh, Ms. Aina is the best person to talk about this because she has done a lot of research on this and she is uh, a Thai national uh, and uh, a PhD candidate at the Center for West Asian Studies at the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Jawahar Nehru University in New Delhi, India. Welcome to our webinar, Ms. Aina. Thank you very much for your kind willingness to talk to us and explain to us about this very important topic and without further ado uh, i give the floor to you so go ahead and make your presentation uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, very good evening to all the audience uh, from malaysia especially and i hope there are also some thai watching this and also maybe other countries, yeah. And thank you so much, Professor Nasari and uh, Hashim Sani Center for Palestine Studies for inviting me uh, to speak on the topic of Judaization of East and Goods. So, Al Quds. I think I should explain what Al Quds means first, right? Al Quds means uh, Jerusalem. It's an Arabic word. So I will be talking about East. And good, so it's only East Jerusalem. So um, I will cover around fifty years of occupation, which is from nineteen sixty-seven to two thousand seventeen, and this is like part of my uh, PhD thesis. So I'm presenting part of it here. It's all of you, and so if we see uh, the case of uh, East Jerusalem, right? um there are two parts of uh east jerusalem uh, there are two parts of jerusalem sorry there is west jerusalem and east jerusalem so um in 1967 east jerusalem was annexed by israel right so if we compare uh east jerusalem to west bank and gaza strip right we hear a lot about uh west bank and gaza strip right about the violence right but in uh, East Jerusalem, there is a lesser degree of violence, but there is more with legal violence, which I will be presenting today. So I use the word Judaization here, right? Uh, so what does it mean, Judaization? So Judaization in this context, it means to make things Jewish. Like it's for the case of East Jerusalem, it means to change the character of uh, Jerusalem to being Jewish. This includes all aspects, demography, territorial, 
cultural, religious, economic, right? And in my thesis, I use secular colonialism, right? And I find that Judaization is like another name for uh, secular colonialism. It's like the Zionist version of secular colonialism. But in this presentation, I will use both the words Judaization. Why they, uh, in order to Judaize, they have to de arabize right? So I will explain further, like uh, in later in my uh, presentation, what it means. So, so in this uh, seminar, I will discuss the legal, political, economic, cultural, and religious dimension of Judaization. So uh, before we uh, talk about uh, Jerusalem, or we talk about East Jerusalem in this uh, like in this seminar, right? Actually, like history is very important in order to understand why uh, the Zionists uh, claim Jerusalem, right? So um, Zionists claim like there are many claims, there are many Zionists claim like the Jewish exile, right? That Jews like were exiled from Jerusalem, that Jerusalem was Jewish homeland, that uh, Jerusalem was the uh, existence of the Jewish kingdom in the past, in the past, right? So these are like uh, these are not invented by Zionists. These are Jewish belief, right? We have to understand this. Actually, we have to uh, actually. Uh, make a separation or make a distinguish between Zionists and Jew, right? Not all Jews are Zionists. So the Jewish exile, uh, the Jewish homeland, and the existence of Jewish kingdom in the past, these are all Jewish belief. But Zionists use this, Zionists use the religious belief of the Jews to justify their claim of Jerusalem. So, um, so like uh, if we compare uh, Israel to other settler colonies, right? Uh, I will just give you examples of other settler colonies like uh, New Zealand, uh, America, Australia. These were all settler colonies, but no one claimed that they were there before. No one have like religious claim to these areas, right? But Zionists has this claim. So. Among all the settler colonies, Zionists has the strongest claim to the land. And if we see the interaction of Jew with Jerusalem, it has been like since 1200 BC, right? Until now, like Jews have always been part of Jerusalem. And Jews are under different empires. And different empires have different policy towards Jews. Some are more aggressive. Some are more kind, and Muslim empire especially are known for like being kind to other religious communities. And there is one evidence uh, of uh, it's a manuscript which is uh, stored in synagogue in Egypt. This is called Cairo Genisa. So Cairo Genisa is a uh, it's a manuscript of a flourishing culture between Jews and Muslims. So in this uh, manuscript, it was even documented that Umar ibn al-Khattab once invited Jews to Jerusalem. So this, if you can see in the slide, this is a manuscript uh, called the, in the Cairo Genisa. It's written in Arabic, it's written in Aramaic, it's written in Hebrew, and these are written by Jews. So this mentioned the flourishing culture between Jews and Muslims in the past, right? And it's not only Umar al-Khattab that invited Jews to come to Jerusalem. Salahuddin and Ayyubi, uh, Sultan Sulaiman of the Ottoman. So I just wanted to say that Jerusalem has always been a pluralistic city. It's a place where Jews, Muslim, Christians used to live together. I mean, there was to some extent, peaceful coexistence at least for a thousand years, and this is well documented, right, in history, in these studies. So, but this 
began to change, right? When uh, with, with the advent of Zionism and Jews began to come to Jerusalem and Palestinians welcomed them. They did not know that they came to take their land. They just accepted them as they have accepted them before. But then this changed after 1948, right? And a lot of uh, scholars have called it as settler colonialism. The peaceful law coexistence that existed existed in the past now become a form of colonialism. Jews no longer came to Jerusalem to settle. They came to settle and to replace the Palestinians who have lived here. And one more thing, there are also Palestinian Jews who are call themselves as Arab. They are Arab Jews. They are not European Jews. And they also live with the Palestinian and they have lived with the Palestinian for a long time. They also exist in Jerusalem now. So before we go to the uh, about the dimensions that I was mentioning that I will be discussing today. So we have to discuss what happened in 1967, right? When Israel occupied uh, Palestinian territories. No Israel political parties have objection over the occupation of OPT. Everyone, all the parties agree that we would occupy all the uh, Palestinian territories, which are West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. And all the political parties made it very clear that with East Jerusalem, they will annex it. So, so East Jerusalem, Israel used Israeli civil laws to govern the Palestinians who are in East Jerusalem, right? But with the West Bank and Gaza Strip, Israel used the military laws. So these are the differences between the two Palestinian communities, right? The, uh, they are given different guards, right? Palestinians in East Jerusalem are given blue guard, and Palestinians in uh, West Bank and Gaza Strip are given green guard. So we will come now to the uh, legal and political dimension of Israel Judaization of East Jerusalem, right? So even though Israel like annexed East Jerusalem, but Israel never used the word annexation in the any official document, right? It never used it. Uh -huh. So. But Israel extend, extend laws, as you can see in this uh, slide. So these are the three main laws that Israel extended to East Jerusalem in 1957, right? And in order to strengthen East Jerusalem, Israel also passed a law known as Jerusalem Law. Israel declared that Jerusalem is complete and united uh, capital of Israel. And in 2000, Israel also passed a law that 51 words is required in the Neset if there is to be any change in the boundary or the transfer of municipality authority. And also in 2018, Israel make an amendment again that 80 words of the Neset members, Neset is the Israeli parliament. So you need the 80 member votes in order to change the uh, municipality authority or the boundary. So it means that, what it means here, it means that Israel will not give East Jerusalem to the Palestinians. It will not come from the Israeli parliament because it's not possible it's in, in Israel Neset. They, there are only 120 Neset members. It's very difficult to get 80. Even 60 is also difficult. So, uh, So this is how like Israel use uh, Israel Judaize uh, East Jerusalem by uh, territorial to territorial territorial expansion, right? So I think the map is very small, but if you can see the red uh, line that is circling this, yeah, this is Israel uh, vision of Greater Jerusalem. So 
as I show in the previous slide, Jerusalem is East Jerusalem is very small, right? It's only this area. But now Israel plans to like uh, extend the borders of Jerusalem municipality. So by extending the border, what does it mean? It means that Israel will take more West Bank land to be part of East Jerusalem, right? And we will not know this. It's carefully done by building the separation barrier to include all this West Bank land to East Jerusalem. So uh, in 1967, right, East Jerusalem, as I said, it was a very small, only six square kilometers, right? And Israel, uh, in 1967 itself, Israel also expanded 64 square kilometers more from the West Bank, right? And if we talk about Israel political parties, uh, the Likud and Labour may have differences with the West Bank or the Gaza Strip, but with East Jerusalem, they are the same. Labour may not build many settlements during its first 10 years of the occupation, right? But in East Jerusalem, Labour built extensively since 1967. So as I said that, in East Jerusalem, it's different from West Bank and Gaza Strip. It's, it's a legal violence, as you will see after this. So these are the two main laws that Israel used to expropriate Palestinian land. And these are like very old law. You can see 1943, this is from British mandate. So these are AO law, especially are the main law which Israel used to expropriate uh, Palestinian land. Palestinian land in the West Bank, Palestinian land in the East Jerusalem, right? So like in many countries, like every country has expropriation law, which government will take like land for public purposes, right? And then they will compensate you for that, right? But in the case of East Jerusalem, Palestinians are compensated very little. And the land are not used for public purposes. It used to build settlement, right? So th that were the two main law, but there are two, there are more laws, as you can see. Absentee, absentee property law. What What is this uh, law? This law means that if Palestinians, the owner of uh, the land, are not present in East Jerusalem, they might be deemed absentee. So Israel said that then we can take your land, right? And then uh, the three laws here that you see below, uh, these are laws that allow Jews who lost their land in 1948 to claim back their land in East Jerusalem. So I will just give you a little bit of pretext here. So uh, before 1948, in Jerusalem, there are uh, East and West Jerusalem, right? So there are Palestinians and Jews in both the parts. So when it got divided, right, those Jews who are in East part, Eastern part, they have to migrate, migrate to the Western part and Palestinians also migrated some to, from the West uh, Jerusalem, some migrated to East Jerusalem, some migrated to West Bank, Gaza Strip. So you can see that some Palestinians say that they are refugees in Gaza Strip, they are refugees in East Jerusalem, they are refugees in West Bank, right? So, so these laws allow Jews to claim back uh, the land in East Jerusalem. And there are cases, there are a lot of cases about this. And these are not the original owner. They just say that these belong to Jews and we have a rightful uh, ownership of it. If you, uh, I think all of us hear about Muhammad and Kurt family, right? So his case is in Czech Jarrah. We hear, we hear a lot about Sheikh the Rock and Bay last two years, right? So his case is exactly this. His house, so his grandmother, he, she just died like two, three years back. She died at 102 years old. So she has a long struggle with the fairness. So, um, so she was in Haifa. She was born in Haifa in 1948. She left Haifa and she moved to East Jerusalem. She, I mean, she migrated to East Jerusalem as a refugee 
she has to flee Haifa to East Jerusalem. And she was granted land under UNRWA, which is a UN uh, agency that deals with Palestinian refugees, right? And then, so from that land that she was granted, she built house, right? And now, after 1967, when Israel occupied uh, Palestinian territories, right? So Jews began to claim the land through this law. They did not claim like uh, baselessly. They claimed it through laws. They fight it through courts, right? So, so she has been fighting throughout her life to protect her house. And she said one statement that if you want to take this land, let me go back to Haifa. I will not give you this land, but if only if you allow me to go back to Haifa. So they fought a long uh, fight with the court. And now in, it ended up that their house got divided between settlers and their family. And it's only a, like, a very thin wall between them and the settlers. If you heard about uh, Yakub, Yakub who like, uh, if I don't steal your land, somebody else will steal it. So Yakub also resided in Muhammad Ankur's family. And Yakub is not the owner of this land. Yakub is from America. And we heard that he speaks English. He spoke English to Muna al Kurt, which is a uh, uh, sister of Muhammad al Kurt. So this is how like uh, Israeli Jews use laws to claim land. Apart from the the laws that you were mentioned, these are used by uh, a normal people to claim land. But apart from laws, right? Uh, there is also a legal purchase. Israeli Jews also buy from Palestinians. So maybe it's a sad reality for Palestinians also about this thing that many Palestinians, not many, some Palestinians also sell land to Israeli Jews because they pay a huge amount of money, right? So, and and the, uh, the Israeli Jews, the settlers, they say that this is a legal purchase because the law does not, does not ban us to buy your land, right? It's legal, right? And it's not only this, like, there are also Palestinian middlemen. So, like, some Palestinians, if they want to sell land, they will hire a broker as an agent to sell land for them, right? But then this broker, like, uh, they sell land to the Zionists. They collaborated with the Zionists and sell land to the Zionists. So, so, a lot, so many land ended up in Zionists through this means. And the thing is, we, we, we might blame Palestinians for this, but actually, like, uh, Palestinian Authority uh, banned land sale to Jews in the OPT, and it's also included East Jerusalem. But since Palestinian Authority does not have any uh, authority over East Jerusalem, right, because it's under Israel, so it cannot ban, uh, it cannot uh, prohibit Palestinian East Jerusalem might from selling land, right? But in Israel, there is a law that bans Israeli Jews from selling land to foreigners. So Israel can protect their land, but Palestinians cannot do it. And we know that in every country, right, we have a law that how much foreigners can buy land, right? If you don't put restriction, of course, there will be people who violate it. And this is like very normal thing. So now we'll come to demography. Just now I talk how Israel Jew dies Palestinian through territorial expansion right so now it will be demography so how like in order to uh judaize right so we will have to de-arabize palestinians so in uh 1972 uh, Golda which is a female israeli prime minister she declared very clearly that in east jerusalem we have to maintain the demography at 70 30 70 percent jews and 30 percent palestinians and they could maintain this until 1990s. In 1990s, the ratio started to drop. It started to be 60-40. 60% Jews and 40% Palestinians. So in 2000, uh, according to the Jerusalem Master Plan, they realized that, okay, let's change it. Now we'll, we'll make it 60-40. So the first one, 
it's about permanency, uh, permanent residency status. So uh, this is very important that it's a, also a tool that Israel used to de Arabize the uh, Palestinians. So the main discriminatory law uh, that is used in this regard is called the entry law. So Palestinians are granted permanent residency status under entry law. Entry means you enter Israel, right? But Palestinians, Jerusalemites have been part of this land. They do not enter Jerusalem. So the entry law is not only used with a Palestinian residents. It's also used with foreigners who came to Israel and they get permanent residency status. Palestinians are treated the same like those foreigners. So what does it mean? It means that permanent residency status can be removed, right? If you do not fulfill conditions. And this is mentioned to laws and it, that's nowhere it mentioned about Palestinians in the laws. So you might have a question. If permanent residency status is too fragile, can Palestinians uh, apply for citizenship? There are options for Palestinians to apply for citizenship, right? But the conditions are very difficult for Palestinians to accept it. The first one, they have to be able to speak Hebrew. The second one is even more difficult because they have to play, pay allegiance to the state of Israel. So for many Palestinians, they cannot fulfill these conditions, even though that they know that permanent residency status is very difficult for them to be in this city. And, and Israel knows that Palestinians will not take these conditions, right? So that's why it makes it that way, because it makes it difficult so that Palestinians will not take it. And they kind of succeed with that. And even like uh, some Palestinians, they try to apply, right? They still did not get the citizenship status. So this also shows something here. And so it's not only this entry law. In 2003, this is another law. You can see that I'm discussing a series of laws that Israel used to jeopardize uh, Palestinian, uh, to jeopardize East Jerusalem. So another law is citizenship and entry into Israeli into Israel law. And this is a temporary provision. This was enacted in 2003. It was during Intifada. Israel like fear that a uh, Palestinian might uh, sneak into Israel and carry suicide bombing and all, right? So this law, what does it mean? Like it banned spouses of Palestinian East Jerusalem might from receiving permanency, uh, permanent residency status. If they marry someone from the West Bank, they cannot, uh, uh, the, their spouse do not get the permanent residency status. If they want to live together, they have to go outside Israel. Outside, I mean, outside East Jerusalem. And permanency res permanent residency status is also denied to their children, right? So if you deny this even to children, it's very difficult for them. So the uh, Israel uh, authority even uh, prohibited or even like make it limited to whom Palestinian can marry, right? And I said that it was enacted during Intifada, right? But this law was extended for 20 years. So you cannot claim that this is about security anymore. And actually like, uh, if you know uh, two, three years back, if you remember the prime minister, Yed Lapid from Yesh Atid party, he said, like, very clear, I will just quote him, we shouldn't hide the essence of the citizenship law. It's one of the tools aimed at ensuring a Jewish majority in the state of Israel. So he accepted that it's not only about security. The law also means that we wanted to control the Palestinians, right? Because if you give permanent residency status to Palestinians, then who marry someone from the West Bank or uh, outside Israel, then the demography will increase, right? And also it's a way to de them. Oh, if you want to marry them from the West Bank, those from the West Bank, then go out of East Jerusalem. And this is important. If they go out of East Jerusalem, what will happen to them, which I will discuss later. 
So now we'll come with this disenfranchisement. So uh, Palestinians uh, who live in East Jerusalem, East Jerusalem is under Jerusalem municipality, right? So as a permanent residency status, they can vote in municipal election, but they cannot vote in the national election because they are not citizens. So why is this important? Because municipality only deal with like basic welfare of residents, like housing, education, but with laws like the, the laws that uh, were implemented discriminatory to Palestinians, Palestinians in East Jerusalem, they cannot voice their concern in the municipal, through the municipal, uh, municipal channel, right? And they cannot do in the national election because they cannot vote. So they are disenfranchised in the Israel political system. But they have to abide all the laws that they don't have a say in those laws, right? So, but there, are, there is also a debate uh, in Palestinian community even to vote for in the municipal election, right? Whether we should vote or not, it's not even useful. And by voting, does it mean that we are accepting the Israeli occupation? So it's a, a lot of dilemma that is going on in, in the Palestinian community. And now come the building permit. So why is this important, building permit? Uh, I, I think in like in any country, not just East Jerusalem, like we need to apply for building permit in order to build a house. Right? But for Palestinians, it's very difficult. In 1967, Israel stole like land, right? This is for a uh, green area. This is for school, for houses. But only 13% of land in East Jerusalem is for Palestinians to build their houses, right? So, and most have already been built up in this 13%, right? So the land is already limited, right? And then uh, there is no real estate project where Palestinians can go and buy, you know, like um, maybe a house or an apartment unit from there. There is no such thing in East Jerusalem. So in order to build a house, you have to do everything by yourself and that also includes uh, applying for the building permit and there are many obstacles for palestinians like they for example like the plan is not like before ha uh, getting a building permit you need a plan uh, the plan which says like how much uh, stories you can build like how much uh, residential units you can have and it's very limited in the Palestinian areas. You will not see high rise building in Palestinian areas. So when the stories is limited, so very uh, limited uh, residential areas you know, for the Palestinians, right? But if you compare to the Jewish settlements, they can build four stories. They can build more residential units per dunam. Per dunam, it's equal to 900 square meters. And then also like, they need to make sure that the infrastructure is uh, available, like the sewage system, electricity system. In order to get the building permit, they have to make sure all of this. So it's very like difficult. And financial limitation also, because building permit, the cost of uh, applying is very high. It's about uh, one estimate shows that it's about 250,000 shekels, which is around 80,000 US dollars. This is only building permit. We have not uh, come, uh, we have not calculated about the cost of building uh, a house. And we have to uh, keep in mind that 78% of Palestinians in East Jerusalem live below poverty line. So this is a very difficult. And with uh, Israeli settlers, the government gives subsidies, but it's very rare for the Palestinians, right? So, and also like uh, in order to build, in order to get a building permit, the last obstacle for Palestinian is land, registra land registration. They need to get their land registered first, right? And for many Palestinians, they don't want to go because the on owner of the land might not be present in Jerusalem because uh, Palestinian land, like I read that the owner is not just one. So if you need to register, all the owners have to be present and sign 
or do all the documents together. So if the owner is not there in East Jerusalem, the land might be deemed as a senti. So instead of getting your land registered, you get your land taken away from you. So Palestinians didn't want to take that risk. So what they do? So they build without building permit. So what will happen to them? Their house get demolished, right? And and this is like a very serious and very um, what do you call like it happens uh, to many Palestinians because there is an Israeli NGO called Israeli campaign about house demolition. So this is an Israeli NGO that works on campaigning about the demolition of Palestinian houses. So you can see how serious the issue is. And even to demolish the house, even you get an order that your house will be demolished. To demolish, you also have to have money to hire someone to, to demolish your house. So for Palestinians, it's difficult. So what they do, they demolish their house by themselves. This is like available in all the documentaries. Uh, a lot is available, so you can watch this. And so this is a uh, demolition due to unlawful construction, right? But there is also a demolition as a punishment. So what does it mean? If you resist the Israeli occupation, like to any means, maybe, maybe you throw stones or you make some laws or whatever, Israeli authority, authority might demolish your house. So it's not only punish you, but it punish your entire family. So Judaization, like lead to the Arabization. Like we talk about how Israel the Arabic Palestinians, right? So then how this Palestinian will be ad the Arabic from East Jerusalem. So when their house get demolished, where do they go, right? So some Palestinians go to uh, some areas that are further from the uh, center of East Jerusalem. And some cannot afford right, to rent or build a new house in East Jerusalem. Because East Jerusalem is one of the uh, uh, city that has the highest cost of living in Israel. So it's difficult for Israeli Jews and it's also more, much more difficult for Palestinians, right? So many Palestinians go out of the separation barrier. So I have to give a little bit of explanation here that when Israel built the separation barrier in 2002 due to the Intifada, Israel excluded some uh, neighborhood of East Jerusalem. So it means that some neighborhood of East Jerusalem which is used to be part of Jerusalem municipality is outside the barriers. These are called Ufar al Kap Chuf Afat refugees and part of Kalandia, right? These are officially part of the Jerusalem municipality, but they are excluded from the barrier and they are neglected from the Jerusalem municipality. And a lot of Palestinians, like thousand, 100,000 live here. So those who got their house demolished they live in this area and if they cannot uh stay stand you know the conditions here they will go to west bank and when they go to west bank what will happen to them they will lose their permanent residency status because they no longer maintain their life center of life in east jerusalem so this is how israel the arabized palestinians this is one of the means right and also permanent residency status so there are conditions that uh, you have to maintain in order to preserve your status, right? So in 1974, Israel made a major amendment to the uh, entry law that in order to maintain your uh, permanency res permanent residency status, you have to, uh, sorry, your permanent residency status will be revoked if you live seven years in a foreign country. Second, if you receive permanent residency status uh, from other country. Third, if you receive a citizenship of a foreign country, right? But 
it's really a uh, settler so it's really Jews. they can have both dual nationality they can have two nationalities but that is not possible for palestinians right so so this law when it was amended in 1974 it was not used against anyone until 1988 it was first used against mubarak awas this is an activist he left uh, east jerusalem like 10 20 years before and he got a u.s citizenship and after he got it he used to come back to east jerusalem back and forth in his last visit in 1988, he got his permanent residency status removed. So he uh, filed a court, filed uh, to Israeli court, right? And then they said that you break the law because you got uh, a foreign citizenship. And he said, how can you revoke my permanent residency status? I was born here. I sh it should be treated as a special status. You should not take, uh, treat us as a foreigner who came to Israel and get a, state, a permanent residency status. So many Palestinians, right, like Mubarak Awad, like they also leave uh, East Jerusalem to find good jobs or better education. But then, unlike Mubarak, they will come before uh, seven years in order to renew their status. Right, so they have been doing this for a long time, but then in 1995, Israel made some change this law again, like it changed the interpretation of the law. So, from 1995 uh, to 2000, there were 3,303 revocation of permanent residency, uh, uh, permanent residence of uh, Palestinians, right. And to compare with night from 1967 to 1994, 28 years, there were only 3,078 revocations. So in just five years, it's much more than uh, three decades, right? So, so Israel did not make any amendments, but Israel made a new interpretation to the law. And the NGO call it as center of life policy, right? So. Um, so this means that now it's very difficult for Palestinians. Even if they will come every seven years, they might got their residency status revoked because if they will say that your center of life is not in Jerusalem, right? So how if they will uh, know this, right? So Palestinians sometimes they have to go to the Israeli authority sometimes for some office work or something like this. So before proceeding the um the work right Israel will ask you like you have to prove us your electricity bill you have to show us your tax bill right so when they cannot show right so it's very like oh your center of light is not in the state, so your residency status will be removed, right and it's not sure how long they can be outside the world now because we don't know what Israel means by center of light policy like center of light right so uh, the first one is Awad Rui, right? That he was, he got his permanent residency status revoked. And the second one is Center of Life. There is another one, which is called Disloyalty to Israel. So in 2018, Israel made an amendment to the entry law that if any Palestinian uh, make something that may deem as disloyalty, to the state of Israel, their residency status is removed. And this is very controversial one because it can happen to any Palestinian Jerusalem. Right? So now uh, we will come to the economic dimension, right? So you might wonder like how economic dimension relates to this, right? So uh, permanency permanent residency status also determine what job you can do because when you are not a citizen right some job will be uh, restricted to you right you cannot uh, apply for uh, government jobs right for palestinian east jerusalemites there are some public jobs in east jerusalem that 
they can apply but it's very limited so in like uh before 1960 uh east jerusalem was under jordan right so at that time the economy was not that prosperous but it relied on tourism because in that time jerusalem used to be a center of the arab world right so the main income of Palestinian East Jerusalem might used to be tourism. There used to be uh, East Jerusalem airport where Arabs do come to East Jerusalem, right? So when Israel occupied in 1967, Palestinian lost this source of income because tourism is now controlled by Israel. So a lot of Palestinians become cheap labor, right? Some of them work in construction, some of them work in industrial areas. These are jobs that Israeli Jews or Israeli settlers do not want to do, right? And those who are like more better off, like they are businessmen. The Palestinian businessmen also face a lot of obstacles because like tax policy is very high and there is also limited infrastructure in East Jerusalem as I mentioned. But for Israeli businessmen, there are subsidies, which is very rare, rare for uh, Palestinian businessmen. And then Palestinian East Jerusalem mice cannot apply for public jobs, right? But then for some other jobs, like there are also conditions that you need to be able to speak to. You need to have Israeli school certificate. And a lot of Palestinians, they graduate from Palestinian schools, Palestinian universities, right? So it's very difficult for them. So you might think that if job is limited, if you do not get good education as you want, why don't you go abroad, right? Because it's phenomenon everywhere that people go abroad for better education, better career opportunities, right? But for Palestinians, this, this will mean that their center of life is not in this direction, and their residency status will be reduced. So there is a, a, a case of one young man. This is from one documentary, like, he's a son of a professor of an Ud University. So he graduated uh, from a university in East Jerusalem. And then he told his father that he could no longer depend on him financially. He needs to leave East Jerusalem because he could not buy a different job, right? So he left. And uh, in the Ms. Maina, Ms. sorry, uh, I think you have to... Uh, check your microphone because uh, the noise is, uh, yeah, hearing with your, your condition. Okay, can you try again? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear now? Yeah, okay. So, so uh, the son of this professor, he left East Jerusalem and then uh, for a good job that he wanted, right? Because he could not no longer depend on his father. And then in the documentary, it shows that he came back as a tourist. His permanent residency status was revoked. So he came to visit his father very sadly. It was a documentary that shows the conversation between a father and a son. And his father says that this is a typical life of Palestinian youngsters who have to go to this reality. So now you come to the cultural dimension. Uh, Israel like uh, did not ban Israel ban some cultural events that are organized by uh, Palestinians, right? If Israel came to know that this is organized by Palestinian authority, right? Because Israel was would say that this is under our sovereignty. If you want to organize any event, you have to ask our permission. But there are also some cultural events that are not organized by Palestinian Authority, but Israel still ban them, right? So why Israel ban them? Because like for Palestinians, if they organize any cultural events, either films, music, or any other events, they would also include the story about their life under occupation, their life under Israeli rule, right? So this is why Israel banned those events. So one uh, Palestinian says that, if you just sing a song about life, like normal life, Israel would not say anything. But when you start talk about occupation, then they will try to stop you.
so so this is what happened to Palestinians, even to preserve their culture. It's very difficult for them. And one of uh, one very obvious thing that happened with the Palestinian in East Jerusalem, it has to do with the Arabic language, not to ban them from speaking Arabic language, but the Arabic language that is visible in the signs. So the most prominent one is that in the beginning, right? Israel used the word uh, Jerusalem in Hebrew, right? And then the word "ungood" in Arabic would be put in parentheses, right? But now, if you see street in East Jerusalem, Israel will use the word Jerusalem in Hebrew, and then the Arabic name "ungood" will be in uh, Arabic, but it's a transli transliteration of the Hebrew word. So Israel will write Jerusalem in Arabic. So "ungood." Is no longer there, so it's very important that uh, Professor Nasari suggested me to use the word "ungood" because it's not even there in the street side, in the new street side in East Jerusalem. Yeah, and then uh, actually, the Israel municipality also has been trying to change a lot of uh, Arabic street names into Hebrew, so it has been doing that since 1967. Right, and now you come to the uh, religious dimension. So when it comes to the religious dimension, uh, I will talk about two main things. Right, it's the Judaization of the Muslim holy places, right, and then the policy toward the Christian community, because a lot of Christian uh, also live in East Jerusalem, right. Even though there are more Muslims there, but there is a substantial number of churches in East Jerusalem also. So with Muslims, right, uh, it has to do with the Western Wall and the Harab al-Sharif, right? So uh, we might hear about Jewish claim, right, to the Al-Aqsa, that they want to demolish the Al-Aqsa, right? But if we study, uh, if we go deeper, we will see that in the beginning, uh, even before uh, Zionism, the advent of Zionism, or during the British mandate, there was almost no claim to the Al-Aqsa. Jews only pray in fall of the Western Wall, right? Even the, during the British mandate, there is a one chief rabbi of Israel. He, his name is Abraham Isaac Cook. This is very important name because he is considered the founder of National Religious Party, or what we call them as Orthodox uh, Zionists or Religious Zionists. So he issued a warning during the British mandate. He is the first chief rabbi of Israel. He issued a warning that uh, the holiness of the temple has not been lost. So we cannot even enter the temple, not to talk about building a third temple. Because according to him, we have to wait for the Messiah. right? So, But then this began to change in 1967. Some Jews like rushed to the Temple Mount that they wanted to pray there. But Moshe Dayan, which is an Israeli uh, minister of defense at that time, he prohibited them that you pray at the, Al uh, at the Western Wall and Al-Aqsa is already reserved for Muslims. So he is from the Labour Party. At that time, he just wanted to maintain some clam at the site, right? Because Israel just occupied uh, Palestinian territory. He did not want to... Uh, receive a lot of condemnation from the international community right so from then like so one very significant thing that we need to know that the chief rabbi of israel also prohibited jews from entering the al-aqsa not just an al-aqsa the haram al-sharif the square which include the dome of rock and al-aqsa mosque so the sign as you see in the slide is put at the maghribi gate which is one of the gates to the Haram al-Sharif. You can read in the slide, right, that you, can, that you cannot enter it because the holiness of it has not been lost. And the sheep rabbi, even today, still maintain the same position that it's not even allowed to enter it, not to talk about building the Temple Mount, right? But then, uh, but then there have been violations since 1957, there are Jews who are trying to pray, but it's still not that many.
but this began to change in the 1990s right a group of jews began to like pray in group in uh the harab al sharif compound right and they um they also try to uh make a amendment in the law right they tried first in 1996 with the first netanyahu government this is from the national religious party that i was telling just now so they told netanyahu that in the policy guidelines of our government you should mention that there would be an arrangement for jewish prayer in the haram al sharif but uh netanyahu was uh did not respond like uh to them he just uh make it like that uh the freedom of holy places will be open to all so it's very like ambiguous he did not make it like very clear that he will allow the jewish prayer to the site right but even if it's not allowed right but we see that there are violations of this uh jews right so if we will see like that uh in in israel uh society there are three schools with regard to the temple mount so the first one is like the temp the temple mount should be built today so some of them call for the destruction of the al-aqsa or the haram al-sharif right and then the second school is like uh we will wait for the messiah but we will pray now in the uh, haram al-sharif and the third school is the old school that uh, we were talking that we will only wait for the messiah and the holiness of the temple mount is there we cannot even enter it right so there are debates right even among the religious parties themselves and the labor and meres party these are like a leftist party they do not uh, agree with this because they are seculars they are they consider themselves seculars and they want jerusalem to be a more pluralistic society they don't want it to be so religious they don't want uh because in israel there is also debate whether israel should be a secular state or religious state so that's why they don't want this religious finance party to take over the political structure of the country because if they can do with this they can go with other things also and why the issue of prayer is very important you might think that it's very vast why don't you share right because the thing is this has already happened with a uh, ibrahimi mosque in hebron because the jews demand prayer in the uh, ibrahim mosque right ibrahim mosque and then uh, finally israel uh, government make a division of the mosque that jews and palestinians both can pray in the mosque so palestinian fear that the same thing might happen to al-aqsa and the fear is not uh, that um, the fear is very serious also because apart from this there is also archaeological excavation around al-aqsa mosque in silwal especially if you hear about this and some of the excavation are under al-aqsa and it's actually affect the structure of al-aqsa mosque there are cracks in the mosque there are cracks in the al-haram al-shari so this is a very serious issue that is happening in east jerusalem and so when it come to the uh, policy toward the christians right so uh, i think i don't have that much time now right it's already one hour so i will try to wrap this up um uh, so with christian community it as far as i know they do not have dispute over holy places the way uh uh jews have with muslims right so here it has to do more with their land so when i uh, work on my thesis i'm very like a little surprised that there are so many churches in east jerusalem and these uh, churches belong to foreign government some churches belong to french russian german greek and this country is like they got this land during the ottoman some bought land from the ottoman some were gifted by the ottoman like the french they help ottoman in the crimean war so they were gifted land by ottoman and they built church and they still claim that this is our territory so it's very complicated in east jerusalem but i will just talk about greek orthodox church uh this is a very important church authority because this church authority own a lot of land 
in East Jerusalem and also in Israel, the state of Israel now. So, so Israel tried to get land from this Greek Orthodox Church because it's more easy because the authority of the church is not Palestinian. These are Greek nationals, right? So you might have heard about the case of the firing of the uh, Greek patri patriarch, right? Because they sell land to uh, the Israeli settlers. They sell church land to Israeli settlers. And these are very strategic areas in East Jerusalem which they have sold. So, so far, there are two patriarchs who have been fired by uh, the uh, Palestinian community, you can say Palestinian Christian community. So, and these are Greek. They are not Palestinian. So the attachment that they will have towards East Jerusalem will be different from Palestinians, right? So, um, and the the Greek, the authority of the patriarch is dominated by the Greek. Only two Palestinians are part of the decision-making uh, body. So it's very difficult for them to voice their uh, concern. So uh, we can talk about the history, but then I'm, uh, I need to end this. That's why it's under three, right? Because the Ottoman uh, gave them the authority uh, after the con uh, the conquest of the Constantinople. So this was the history why uh, the Greek has been the authority of the uh, Orthodox Church. And the concern here is with the Palestinian Christians because they rent their la the, the, the house they built, they rent, rent land from the church, right? Because the concept of wakaf, the endowment, wakaf means endowment, right? So these lands are given by Christian pilgrims, right? So it belongs to everyone. It does not only belong to the church authority, right? So for Palestinian Christians, like, they feel that their life is threatened because now a lot of land is being sold to Israel, right? So now I will end uh, my uh, presentation that you will see that Labour, Likud, and the religious Islamic party, there are many parties of the religious Islamic party, they are the same with the realization of East Jerusalem in terms of territorial, demography, economic, cultural, right? But with religious dimension, they are different, right? So this is why like they still cannot Judaize the al or, or Judaize like East Jerusalem, because even among themselves, they have differences. And also, they also fear the internal, international repercussions that might come to the Israel government. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your very detailed presentation. Uh, we learned a lot about the process Judaization in its many dimensions. A very enlightening, enlightening indeed. That's why I didn't want to stop you, even though you went all the way up to one hour. But I, can you... Um, in this uh, very short time left, can you yeah. elaborate a bit about uh, the international, uh, the fear or the worry of the Zionists towards how the international community perceive their Judaization policy, and 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 therefore they they do, they probably slow it down or they they do not go hundred percent to what they plan to do because of their worry about the international community's perception uh, but we see that what is happening in gaza now they don't seem to care anything about what the international community says mm -hmm. so to what extent uh, do they worry about the international community do they really worry about or can you give some example on on, on how uh, the, the international community has has affected their policy of judaization uh in east jerusalem like i don't I, I don't mean that they have slowed it down, but because they have differences in the uh, among the political parties, so it's very difficult for them to pass laws in the Israel Knesset. And the thing okay. is that they did not slow it down, and also you can see the fraction that is happening in the Israel uh, among the Israel political parties that they like fail to form a government like many times. So okay. also they also fail to pass a lot of laws because they wanted another one to like not be able to complete that term. So this is why like they are kind of slowing as we see, but it's not actually what they wanted to do. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's more of internal differences between themselves, right? So they don't. Uh, so it's not about uh, the, they are worried about the international community. Then it's of more course, of they are worried. They are worried. So that's why they are showing that we do not really. Uh, we still give some space to the Palestinians, but secretly they also they are also doing many things. And when they say things, they say it really like cleverly. You no, know? they will not talk about all these things that we, you know, we have been uh, discussing in this seminar. They will not talk about the archaeological excavations. They will not talk about how they uh, the Arabized Palestinians. They will say these people break their laws, right? That we did not like uh, de Arabize them. We did not like try to Judaize the city. They have to do it carefully because if they do it like in once, right? So of course, like they will be like uh, stopped by the Western government. They will be stopped by the US. So they have to do this, and they have been doing this. That's why they can do till now. They are trying to do like slowly, slowly, and now we can see that they have achieved a lot actually. And it's not stopped. It's increasing every day, every day. Yeah. All right. So uh, the uh, the strategy has always been to incrementally Judaize the. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, so why, by doing it incrementally, they have been able to achieve a lot over the over the decades that they have controlled Al Quds. Uh, probably uh, uh, that is the reason why they are having trouble now because their incremental strategy has been disrupted by the October seven uh, incidents mm -hmm. recently. Uh, they now they are doing everything right in front of everybody and they are under pressure internally to do that because of uh, what happened in October 7. So the incremental strategy had to be abandoned because of the October 7. So that is advantage of, uh, in a way, the benefit for the Palestinian struggle is to expose everything. All right. And uh, because otherwise, otherwise it would have been incremental and and, uh, and soon the whole settler colonial project will be uh, will achieve its aim uh, and the Palestinians will lose their identity, lose their land completely, right? So uh, that so it's very important, therefore, uh, your study is um, being made public. Uh, you publish your study not only uh, in academic journals but also in uh, popular uh, publications like newspapers and magazines so that people know what is happening over there in Al Quds, I think, right? And uh, Alhamdulillah, thank you very much for sharing your study, uh, your knowledge here, so that now people know what is happening over there. Hopefully, uh, uh, people who are watching this can encourage others to watch the We Have Got You Recorded on our YouTube channel and also on our Facebook. and. People can and listen to it again to understand what's happening over there. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Aina. Thank you very much, and hopefully uh, you will uh, uh, progress and successfully get your PhD in the field of al right? Your, your gender field al study. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.